Okay, uh, what we're going to try and do here today is have a look at, uh, not so much at CPD, but have a look at why we are in fact here today. Wh wh why is CPD necessary? Why has the EAAB introduced this little animal called continuing professional development? Uh, and the answer is, it's not something that was sucked out of the air one day when we sat down at a meeting and decided how do we make the lives of estate agents difficult. Uh, it, 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 it's, it's not that at all. The fact is that estate agency has evolved quite slowly, but more progressively now, from what, what we used to call uh, a service sector into a profession. Estate agents are now regarded in all aspects as professionals. And because estate agents are professionals, yeah, um, the th what, what we have to do is we have to observe professional standards where estate agents are concerned. And being a two-way street, we have to do what is required of professionals. And one of the things that the, uh, that the SACWA, the SA Qualifications Authority, requires before they will recognize a body as what they call a professional body, in other words, a body that administers a profession, is to institute a CPD program. So CPD program has to be instituted uh, according to the SACWA guidelines, and uh, that is exactly what we have done. So I'm going to take you through some of the thoughts that I had on professionalization. Okay, uh, to, to break the ice, when I, when I was told that uh, they would like me to do a presentation on the professionalization of estate agents, uh, I did a bit of research to find out what, it, what does professionalization mean. And, what, and one of the things that I came upon was an article that was written by a very well-known legal boffin in 2007. Uh, and what he said in that, in that article is that there's actually no legal obligation upon estate agents to become engaged in specialist tasks. So I thought, hmm, well, <laughs> that's news to me. Uh, and I had a look, yeah, what was written in 2007, so maybe it was written before 2008 when the educational regulations came into effect, and maybe uh, he's reconsidered. But no, he hasn't, because this article has been taken forward year after year after year in all the reviews of the material, and is still contained in the reviews of the material up to 2015. So apparently, the legal boffin still believes that his state agents do not have to be specialists, and do not have to be, become engaged in specialist tasks at all. Uh, what he said was that the services that are rendered by estate agents uh, will not necessarily be in any way um, made less if those estate agents confine themselves only to specialized, to non-specialized tasks. And as far as I'm concerned, and I don't know if you'll agree with me, I think this goes against the whole letter and spirit of professionalization. It, you agree with that? Yeah. Estate agents, uh, from, to the best of my knowledge and belief, do engage in specialized tasks. Because if you didn't engage in specialized tasks, why would you have to go through all that learning? Why would you have to do NQF4, NQF5, PDE4, PDE5, and even this very CPD that we are doing this, morning, this afternoon? So uh, immediately, the, the, a red flag started waving. And my first impression was, uh, this legal expert probably uh, does not understand exactly what estate agents either do or what professionalization of a sector entails. Oh, uh, he then gave us some examples in this article of, of what he means by estate agents not being engaged in specialized tasks, that estate agents are only non-specialists. He took, he took an example of a sectional title unit. Um, and that's only an example, so it, it could apply to any of the differentiated spheres of estate agency, which estate agents do on a daily basis. And this is what he said. Now, just listen to what he said. He said, estate agents are under no legal obligation, perhaps no legal obligation, if you look at it legalistically, he may be right, no legal obligation to explain to a prospective buyer how a sectional title scheme works. You're selling sectional title, and you're not under any obligation to explain how sectional title schemes works. Crazy. Then he said, uh, or even to complete a sale agreement. Now, here you have a situation where you're selling sectional title. You don't have to understand what sectional title is. You simply sell sectional title. You're selling the unit. If 
a, a potential uh, purchaser says to you, what is sectional title? What does it involve? What, what are my obligations? What are my rights? You can quite honestly say, I don't know. I'm not interested. I'm, I'm not here to explain those. I don't need to know these things. Okay, so, so he's saying you don't, you don't need to know anything. You don't, <coughs> you, you don't need to know how sectional title works. And to, 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 to actually make things even worse, he says you don't have to complete a sale agreement. So what, what, do, what does he expect you to do? What, what does he expect you to do? Nothing. Nothing? Just Remember, he's a, he's a legal expert. He's a legal, what does he? He wants you to give it to him so he can get paid. Yes, yes. Yes, what, he, what he's doing, he's basically saying, remember he's a legal expert, he's saying you are second class citizens, you don't understand sectional title, we don't expect you or nor do we think that you're capable of completing a sale agreement, therefore give it to the lawyer. The lawyer will do it and of course the lawyer will charge. Absolute nonsensical, but, but this is what he wrote in the article. He then said, now listen to this, he said, an estate agent can render a quite acceptable service merely by introducing a buyer to a seller of a sectional title unit and thereafter, now here we come to the crux of it, referring the matter to a legal expert uh, to conclude the sale and complete the sale agreement. What is he overlooking in making that statement? What, what, you, do, you, do you agree with what he says over there? No. What is he overlooking? You agree, why? Tell me why. be somewhat qualified, but not properly qualified, to uh, understand the real law of this thing. Okay, does, does, do we agree with that? Uh, no. no. Moline, Moline, come. Moline, tell me what you think. Thanks, Clive. Um, we actually sent all our agents for training to a very well-known attorney. Um, he came to our offices, did the training, and I was quite mortified when he turned around and he said, during the training, he said, don't concern yourself, it's above your pay grade. You want our transfers, but you're saying it's above our pay grade. So, so that's what the attorneys that we're working with think of us as agents. So I applaud what you're doing. Uh, I, we've come a long way, and I know everything Clive's putting into this. So, so really, uh, on behalf of the industry, we applaud what you're doing. You're going to get us to that level. Thanks. Thanks, Marlene. Okay. So we've got two views here. The one view is estate agents may not be entirely competent to do this function. The other view is estate agents are competent to do the function. Okay, <laughs> estate agents should be lifted to that, comp to that uh, level uh, where they are able competently. Remember he said you don't, you, you don't have to do any specialized work. So it's a, so a primary skill. So let's just have a look. What I'm gonna say now is that well, he's overlooking something very definite in saying something like you can render an acceptable service merely by introducing a buyer. The question is, where do you find a buyer? The buyers don't just grow on trees. Buyers don't just fall from heaven. What do, you, what do you need to find a buyer? You need marketing skills. You need a bit of knowledge. You need to have done a job properly so you're going to get referrals. You need a whole lot of skills just to... Uh, just to find a buyer. So it's very easy glibly to say, oh, you don't have to do anything of a, special, of a specialized nature, not necessary, find a buyer. How? How do you find a buyer? And remember, finding a buyer is only one half of the equation. Uh, what's the good of finding a buyer if you don't have a client who's the seller? <laughs> Before you can find a buyer, you need to find a seller. And you need that seller to give you a mandate to find a buyer. So to glibly say that all estate agents have to do, and he's using sectional title as an example, is find a buyer, in my humble view, is missing the point totally and completely. Fair enough. Thank you. So uh, let's, let's carry on and see what he says. Oh, then he, then he does, and so you're an attorney. Then he says, let's refer these matters to attorneys. Is, is there not some kind of hidden agenda in saying estate agents are not good enough, let's rather refer it to attorneys? Let's just say that estate agents do need a certain level of knowledge. I'm not, I'm, I'm not saying that they have to have the knowledge that an attorney or a conveyancer has. They need to have a certain level of knowledge in order to properly carry out their functions, but there's nothing wrong if faced with a question that you don't know to go to an attorney and seek okay. advice. I have no problem with realizing your limitations, but I do have a problem with a legal expert saying you don't have to do functions that require some thought and some kind of real estate knowledge. 
um, that uh, you are only here to do non-specialized work, which exactly is uh, what, what you have said, ma'am, that uh, you are here to do the dirty work. And that is that cannot be right. The point I'm trying to make is that there can sometimes be a misperception out there about what estate agents are, what they do, what they expect you to know, and whether they're professionals or not. And, and the one thing I can tell you, and Morris will confirm that, is that the EAB is doing everything in its power to actually make it known to consumers and to stakeholders that estate agents are professionals. We want estate agents to be regarded as professionals, and as far as we are concerned, there should be no difference whatsoever between a professional estate agent and an attorney and an accountant and an engineer and a, a, a tax person. Estate agents are professionals, and in fact, that is why we're here today. Because, because you are professionals, we have to do professional things. But, but again, it's a two-way street. Um, on the one hand, if, if you are professionals, and you are professionals, and we treat you as professionals, you have to act as professionals. And, and, and that is the question of education, and I concede. Um, and Pam, <laughs> I'm going to ask Pam, Pam, education. Um, we're looking at new qualifications, aren't we? Maybe you can just tell us about that. On behalf of the service of CETA, um, I sit on the board there, and I also, I also chair the, the Real Estate Chamber Committee. Um, we are looking currently at introducing new qualifications over and above the current level four and five qualifications for estate agents, which would just be the, the general qualification, the generic qualification for, for new entrants on level four and for principals on level five. Um, I've just sent the whole list to your office now um, of those that we have actually approved. It would be facilities managers, um, commercial agents, property managing, property managers. Auctioneers already have a qualification, um, but there's a whole list of them. I can quickly have a look if you want. But, they, but we are looking. I think there's six new ones and then the two old ones. The two old ones have now just been re um, Reapproved by SACWA, so that it'll carry on till, 19, till 2019. Um, but the new ones will now be introduced. On the 4th of September, we're having a meeting with, with the Facilities Managers Association of South Africa to ascertain the exact details of this qualification that they require. So we are looking at, at bringing in new qualifications that will eventually serve the whole profession. Now, before you start getting worried, these new qualifications will not apply to you. They're specializations, but they will not apply to already qualified estate agents. They're basically aimed at newcomers, new entrants to estate agents, and they hopefully will provide uh, education of a standard that will enable the estate agents to dispense with lawyers until it comes to the conveyancing process. Okay, so the questions that we asked, and I think we've, we've answered them, does, does the legal scholar envisage second class estate agents, first class professionals? I think the consensus is yes, that's what he does envisage. Is this a valid viewpoint? I think the consensus is no ways. Not a valid viewpoint. Is he losing sight of anything when making this kind of statement? Yes. He's losing sight of the very essence of estate agency. He's losing sight of what estate agency as a profession actually is and involves. So uh, now, remember, estate agents are non-specialized people. Would, do you think that your ordinary consumer, your, your client, your seller normally, would be happy to work with an estate agent who's a non-specialist? Why? Why would I want to use an estate agent who's non specialist? The fact is, I go to an estate agent because that person should be, but I say is, is a specialist. And you know, one thing that I think we take for granted is that estate agents create the property market. Without estate agents, there is no property market. And estate agents deserve to be remunerated for the functions they perform. How often do you hear, and I only hear, have, have any of you heard of this? Where, well, we get it often, well, I do. A, a person will phone me and say, what? I must pay an estate agent 6% when all they do is knock in a, a for sale sign. Do you get that? Now, the thing is that if you are giving a valid professional service, you deserve to be remunerated accordingly. A, an, an attorney gives you a service, he's paid. An accountant gives you a service, he's paid. An estate agent gives you a service, must be paid. And there should be no querying what, what the fee is. This should be agreed up front in any event. And secondly, 
um, when, when you do give an estate agency service, you deserve to be remunerated. And, and I think uh, that's something that we all have to bear in mind, that estate agents, what are you selling basically? You're selling two things. You're selling your skills, knowledge, and competencies as an estate agent, and you're selling your time. And both are worth a lot. Cutting commission, uh, the, the one thing that we know is, in terms of the Estate Agency Affairs Act, the regulator or professional body, there is no commission tariff. Uh, at one stage, the Institute of Estate Agents tried to introduce a commission tariff, and the Competition Commission shot that down immediately. They, it, it, was, it was a standard commission tariff. The Competition Commission said no ways. Uh, a tariff like that inhibits competition and can be collusive. So what the Institute then, they said it won't be a, a, a set tariff, but it will be a recommended tariff. And again, that was shot down. That was shot down. So a tariff, a tariff it's, one of, it's one of the problems, probably something that you all have to think about and overcome. One of the factors of estate agency is commissions are freely negotiable. And the EAB, I might, I might say, when we do get a query, we will tell a stakeholder, a consumer, negotiate the commission with your estate agent. And then what we, what we will then tell the estate agent is once you've negotiated that commission, put it in writing and have the party sign on it. What is that? It's evidence of the agreed amount. So that at the end of the day, when you do perform your mandate, sell the property in this case, uh, and there is, a, there is a, a, a quibble over your commission, you have the evidence to show what your agreed commission was. Um, people are undercutting, but you, you know what uh, we found? that the people who undercut on A, rendering, uh, let, me, let me say, a, a subpar performance, the, the service is not as great, because how can you, act, if you're charging 2%, how can you render an effective estate agency service? You can't. So the, the, what we're finding is, that you remember these uh, for, uh, um, private sale people? Uh, we, 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 we're not estate agents. We are offering you a package to enable you to sell your property. Have they lost it? No. No, no. You know what? At the end of the day, the market deals with these kind of things. And the market wants results, and the market wants uh, to have the, the mandate fulfilled in the best way, in the fastest way, and in the way that achieves the best results. And the only people that really can do that are professional estate agents. So what you're going to find is that no matter what anybody tries to do, and we've heard that attorneys are entering the, are entering the field, but do they last? No. They don't. They don't. Estate agency can be a monster. You, you know, the, 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 what, what, what we always say is the people who thought estate agency is such an easy thing. You know, remember the, the, board, the board housewives, the retired bankers, the retired teachers? When things were great, what would they do? They would come in and become estate agents. It was so easy. You just sell a house and you make, you make a package, you sell a house, easy. How long did they last? Not long. And, and the good news is that with professionalization, with educational requirements, with this very CPD that we are doing today, uh, we are making sure that those people will no longer enter the market. When things improve, they, the board housewives will remain board housewives. The retired teachers will remain retired teachers. The retired bankers, and we get lots of them, I've been, I've been at the bank for 30 years, I want to become an estate agent. You have to go through the ropes. You, you have to become an intern. You have to study. You have, what? But I've been a banker for 30 years. Tough. You may have been a very good banker, but what do you know about estate agency? So what, what we are basically doing through our professionalization, through our commitment to education, is ensuring that only professional estate agents remain in the sphere of estate agency and, and uh, give professional services to stakeholders. And that, that is very, very important to us. And what, what we also are able to do is basically say to consumers, once the EAAB has issued you with a Fidelity Fund certificate, I don't want to hear how long it takes, but once you've got your Fidelity Fund certificate, we have accredited you to consumers as a professional estate agent upon whom you can rely for professional services. And that brings me to another thing. So we'll, while we're talking about it, uh, I've had a lot of people come and see me and say, what is the best way to market ourselves? How do I market myself as an estate agent? And I say there's one fantastic way to market yourself as an estate agent. Give an outstanding performance and get referrals. 
Referrals, 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 referrals. The referrals will make you as an estate agent. And the people who are doing fabulously well as estate agents, you'll never see an advert in the newspaper about them. You'll never see pamphlets being dropped. And what are they doing? They are getting referrals. If you give an honest and a competent and a professional service to a stakeholder, believe me, they talk about it. They will tell their friends, um, if you're ever planning on buying or selling or what other, if, what other estate agency services you want to use, go to Joe Bloggs. He's a brilliant estate agent. I had a wonderful, wonderful experience. And, but the converse also applies. And that's why our, our two percenters and our attorneys are not doing very well. Because uh, if you do not give that brilliant service, if you do not exceed expectations, you are not going to get referrals. And if you don't get referrals, you're not going to make it. So, uh, I, I think our legal scholar um, really missed the boat. Consumers do expect a level of skills and knowledge commensurate with professional estate agency service. Do they expect that level of skills and knowledge? They do expect it, they deserve it, and uh, they must get it. And the Estate Agency Affairs Board and, and so on are doing a wonderful job in getting it that way. Thank you. It comes from an advocate. <laughs> so you can accept that. Yes, yes. Thank you, sir. The, the thing is that estate age, that um, consumers do expect a level of knowledge, skills, and competence from estate agents. They do not expect estate agents to tell them when they're trying to market a sectional title unit that some legal boffin told me I don't need to know what sectional title is. When somebody says, can you draft a clause? I do not expect them to say, no, I cannot draft a clause. I expect an estate agent to draft a clause, if uncertain as to whether it's correct, to seek further advice to make sure it is correct. We, what, one thing we don't want to do, and, and I know we have complaints, is for a, a sale agreement to land on the conveyancer's desk and the conveyancer starts querying, but I don't understand this. What, do you, what did you mean in this clause? That, that, that's very bad. So when, when, when you do complete a sale agreement, and I'm sure everybody can complete a sale agreement, but if there are uh, additional things or, or something that hasn't cropped up before, try and create the clause, but get advice before you finalize it and before the agreement is signed by the parties. At the EAB, the assumption is, there is an assumption, and what is that assumption? Estate agents are professionals. That's what we assume. Estate agents are professionals. The assumption at the EAB is that you are professionals and we accredit you as professionals and we promote you as professionals. Okay, let's have a look at this little cartoon. I thought that was quite cute. Um, you know, all know Hagar the Horrible. Um, he has, he's saying, a member of my crew must be tough, ruthless and never give up even when things look completely hopeless. What makes you think you qualify? I used to sell real estate. Okay, <laughs> so what, what, what does this tell us? What are estate agents? Are, are you tough, yes. ruthless, yes. never give up? Yeah. Now, you know what I'd say? I'd say you're tough and you never give up. I wouldn't say ruthless. You, but you have to be tough and you have to never give up. And we'll talk about that. You know, often, often you are going to find situations where you're going to say it looks impossible. Uh, this mandate looks impossible to fulfill. But then we say, but you're professionals. Find a way to do it. Seek a way. Uh, think laterally. Think, think of new things. Think innovatively, and you will find a way. So uh, I'm, I don't agree with Hagar when he says you're ruthless. Uh, I, don't think he, I don't think that's what he meant, but let's just say that you are tough and that you never give up. And why are you tough and never give up? Because you're professionals. Okay. Now, the question arises, are we achieving our full, our full potential as estate agents? Um, we're going to find that there are a number, as I've said, and we, we, we've even agreed today, there are a number of estate agents who are never going to be successful estate agents. There are, there are a number of people who are just not in, into estate agency. Um, uh, it's horrible, but we, we've had a, some people who have not been able to pass a professional designation exam, and they failed once, and they failed twice, and they failed a third time. I hope there's nobody here because I'm going to run away. They failed a third time, and you know, then they'll come and say, what do I do? I failed three times. And my answer is, find another career. Because pr you're probably not in the right career. You're never going to be successful as an estate agent. That professional designation exam, and I hope has everybody written it, the professional designation exam is an easy exam. It's relatively easy, and it's an open book exam. So th there should be no reason for anyone to fail that exam. And if you failed it three times, 
my only conclusion is you're probably not in the right career for yourself. So we have a look at that. Uh, and then there are persons uh, who, who actually say, and I get this on a daily basis, education is a waste of time. Why must I do education? It's a waste of time. Clients listen to estate agents. And that's why I say, when I come back to being non-specialists, to me, estate agents are like incredible specialists. What are, what are estate agents? They lawyers, because they give legal advice. They are psychologists. They are social workers. They, they listen, to, they, they hear, they, they, they explain tax problems. Es, estate agents do millions of things that people take for granted. If estate agents were only non-specialists, as this legal person says, if estate agents were only non-specialists, I don't think any of you would be in this room today because you wouldn't be estate agents. No one would want to use your service if you came to an estate agent and said, do A, B, C, and the estate agent said, sorry, I'm a non-specialist, go to the attorney. You wouldn't be in business today. No, you wouldn't. So now, education. And now, what I was saying is, um, you, you will get so many calls. Why must I do this education? It's rubbish. I've been working in the sector for 20 years. I know everything there is to know. And the standard answer, which is um, great, it's a beautiful answer, sorry, we've got no alternative. We cannot waive the education requirements. It's in regulations promulgated by government. You have to do it. And the funny thing is, people will then come back, they will go and do the education, and come back after a while, and they do, and say, you know what? Now that I did it, I actually realized I didn't know it all. There were so many things that I did know, so many things that I didn't know, and so many instances where my knowledge was reinforced and I now give a better service to estate agents. And one thing that I will say is, we all have to buy into this new concept of lifelong learning. And that's CPD, lifelong learning. For so long as you remain an estate agent, and it's your career and it's your bread and butter, you need to keep abreast of developments, you need to know what is happening. If, so, if for example, the repo rate, the repurchase rate, is raised by 25 basis points at the next meeting of the Monetary Policy Committee, do you think somebody's not gonna ask you, what does that mean to me? What does that imply to me? What, 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 what am I gonna do about it? You need to be able to say what the repo rate is, and that's a PD exam question, so I hope you've all passed it already. Uh, one of the exam questions is, what is the repo rate? You need to know what the repo rate is, you need to know what the consequences of the repo rate are. So if, if, if the repo rate goes up 25 basis points, you need to be able to tell a client, whether it be a seller or a, a, a stakeholder who is a buyer, what this 25 basis point increase means. Now, if you didn't keep up with knowledge, if you didn't keep up with uh, developments in the industry, you wouldn't have a clue. You would become the non-specialist. They say, what, what does a 25% rise in, in the repo rate mean? Speak to my attorney. And I'm sure he wouldn't even be able to answer that. Education needs to be viewed, and everybody here, I'm speaking to the converted, as an indispensable method of obtaining the necessary skills, competencies, and abilities that you need to act as professional estate agents. So it's taken as a given. And as Pam said, we, we, we're going to have a lot of new occupational qualifications that will start coming in in 20, 2020. Uh, so we've, we've got a bit of time to do that. Uh, and we are going to look at the specializations that Pam mentioned. We're going to look at things that at the moment we, we're not really covering. Uh, a lot of people have complained that the current education is residential based. I, I don't agree with it. Uh, it's actually generic education, but it depends on the facilitator. If I was facilitating and addressing business brokers or addressing commercial brokers, I would contextualize that material so that it made sense to everybody. It seems that some facilitators don't have that competence to do that, but that's not the fault of the education. <clears throat> now, the great thing is, once you've got education, it can never be taken away from you. Once you've achieved that qualification, it can never be taken away from you. Now, maybe let me just tell you what the difference is between a qualification and a designation. A qualification is if you've done your NQF Level 4, that's a qualification. If you've done your NQF Level 5 real estate, that's a qualification. Uh, if you've got your BCom, that's a qualification. If you've got your BA, that's a qualification. That can never be taken away from you. A designation, on the other hand, 
is when you've done the professional designation exam and you get the designation PPRE, Professional Practitioner in Real Estate, if you've done it for principals, MPRE, Master Practitioner of Real Estate, that can be taken away from you. For example, Mr. Joe Bloggs, an estate agent, has his, call it the Further Education and Training Certificate Real Estate, and he has the PPRE, Professional Practitioner in Real Estate, and Mr. Mr. Bloggs has stolen five, th let's make it a lot, five million rand, and he's sentenced to 10 years at uh, Kosimampura Prison in Pretoria. Now, when he goes into prison, he takes his NKF Level 4 qualification, but he does not take the PPRE, because the minute uh, he is no longer competent to hold a Fidelity Fund certificate, he loses that designation. Now, if, like somebody we know, he serves his little, his little stint in jail, and he comes out after 10 months, and he, and he reforms himself, and he then applies to become an estate agent, and the board grants it, that PPRE revives. So the difference is the qualification is there. In Chucky, he can sell real estate to the inmates because he's got his NGF level for, I don't know what he's gonna sell, but he can. But he cannot hold himself out as a professional estate agent. I think you'd all be quite affronted if that man said, I'm a professional estate agent. When he comes out, he's gotta reform, he's gotta show contrition, he's gotta show that the defect in character that led to his incarceration has been remedied, uh, and the EAB does a, a very, thorough investigation and search. Uh, if he then uh, proves that he can become an estate agent again, that PPRE revives. But the, the fact is that education is an essential, as you mentioned, it's an essential for professional estate agent, and the value of education should never be underestimated. So it's, it's one of the things that we have to live with. Uh, it's one of the things as professionals we have to do. We go, we, the EAB is mindful of the fact that you, you, you're sacrificing time. You've, some of you have come from long distances. It's costly. You've had to come here. You've had to pay for your CPD. Uh, we're bearing that in mind. We, we, we don't want the CPD to be onerous to estate agents. We, in fact, want you to enjoy your CPD sessions. We want you to learn from your CPD sessions. And what I said right at the beginning, we want to hear from you. What do you want included in CPD sessions? Uh, our, our CEO is a great person. Uh, the, the one thing that he will always do is listen to what other people say. As I say, we want to make this uh, CPD interesting and enjoyable and that you enjoy being here. So that's, that's something we are going to do. Oh, let's have a look at this. Um, estate agents. Our estate agent's talking. He said, I'll describe the house with words like yummy and tasteful instead of mentioning the termites specifically. Okay, now the house is yummy and it is tasteful because the termites are enjoying it. So, so, so he's, he's telling the truth. He's actually telling the truth. It's yummy and it's tasteful to the termites. But it's not yummy or tasteful to anybody who's going to be buying that property. That brings us to one of the things that we do have. Um, one of the major sources of complaint that we receive at the EAB is the failure to make disclosure. The failure to make disclosure. And the Consumer Protection Act also now kicks in. Because in terms of the Consumer Protection Act, you have to make disclosure. So um, one of the things we, you, you will find estate agents who are going to say it's yummy and it's tasteful. And another problem inherent in estate agency, and I'm afraid it applies to all of us, is estate agency is a profession where you only get paid on results. Once, once the, the seller and the buyer have signed the contract talking about a residential sale or we're entering into a commercial transaction, you get paid. Unlike, I'm not going to mention, unlike some people, you get paid whether they're successful or not. So, uh, so it, you only get paid on results. Now this may lead to a situation where some people are inclined to cut corners. You know what, what goes through their mind is, I need that commission check. Let us just get this transaction through and I'll deal with the problems when they arise afterwards. But the funny thing is those problems do arise afterwards. You cannot brush them under the table. We do get complaints, we do investigate them, we do take them further. And so what I'm trying to say is we need to understand new legislation. We need to understand the Consumer Protection Act. We need to understand what the Consumer Protection Act tells us we have to do when it comes to disclosure of defects. We need to know what remedies are contained in the Consumer Protection Act and how it affects you as an estate agent. And that is something that we are going to be looking at in future presentations. Um, what, what we want to say is that to be, to be a successful estate agent, 
You have to commit yourself to estate agency. You have to be a committed estate agent, else you're not going to be successful. Uh, we, we believe that uh, everybody here today is an achiever in estate agency. There can be no doubt that, we, that I'm speaking to achievers, uh, because if you were not achievers, you wouldn't be here. But there are always ways to think about what you do, to uh, take advice from people, to improve the services that you render, and to make yourself more professional as an estate agent. Um, uh, now, where estate agents are concerned, and this, this is the, the funny thing about it, you know, the, 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 the retired teachers, the retired bank managers, it's easy, you come in and you make a fortune. One thing that we do try and inculcate into estate agents is self-management, because it may be very easy not to self-manage your time. Estate agents need to be committed and need to understand the principles of self-management. You know, and, and I'm sure you all do, that it, it's a job like any other job, and you have to work at it, and if you don't work at it, you're not going to be successful. Uh, it does require an element of discipline. State agents have to be disciplined, and they have to manage themselves, otherwise they're not going to be successful. But I must say, the, the feedback that we get is that this is not a problem area. Uh, that, that estate agents are disciplined, they do self-manage uh, their, their, their work, and they understand. And I think a lot of this is going to percolate through to the new entrance through that internship system, where hopefully the interns who are coming into the arena will realize it is not a joke. This is a very serious profession that you have to work at to be successful, and you have to be dedicated, committed, and self-managed. What are the, some of the skills? One of the skills I was talking about is to accept and understand the necessity for lifelong learning. Because if you don't uh, have lifelong learning, A, you're not going to be a profession, and B, you're probably not going to be successful. There, at the moment, um, I think there's something like 50 professional bodies, five zero, 50 professional bodies that are recognized by the SA Qualifications Authority as professional bodies. And every single one of them requires CPD, requires ongoing education, and requires lifelong learning. It's one of the facets of professionalization, and it's just something that we have to do. Uh, you cannot take the easy way out. Again, uh, you've heard about the people who say, but I know everything. Uh, I've been in the sector for 20 years, what are you going to teach me? I know it all. You don't know it all. Uh, mostly what you know is you know enough to know uh, that you should know more. Because, because uh, no one knows everything. Lawyers don't know everything. What an accountant and a lawyer, any other professional knows is where to find the answers. We don't expect an, a lawyer to know everything. It's impossible. You don't expect an accountant to know everything. It's impossible. I don't expect an estate agent to know anything. It's impossible. You cannot know anything. But what you do need to know is where to find the answers. So there's nothing wrong if somebody asks you a question that you believe You'd rather research before you give an answer. Say, uh, this, this is an interesting question. I need to research it. I will get back to you. Research it and then get back to them with the correct answer rather than give an off-the-cuff answer that is wrong. And the reason I'm saying that is, remember what I said at the beginning? Estate agents are regarded in a very high light by their clients. And they will accept what you say. So if you give the wrong answer, you're going to be responsible for what you've said. It's best if you don't know, and I agree with you there, if you're not sure, if you don't know what the correct answer is, if you're not 100% sure how to complete a sale agreement, get advice. And if the best advice is from a lawyer, go to a lawyer. If the best advice is from an accountant, go to an accountant. If the best advice is from a structural engineer, go to a structural engineer. Go to a, a regional and town planning expert. You go to the expert that you need to get the best advice and give the best advice possible. People believe that by passing the exam, they know everything. And, and that's one of the problems that we have had. Uh, where people, uh, non-principals, have passed the NQF level four real estate qualification and then say, but why do I have to do the professional designation exam? I've already done the NQF level four. And the, the answer is simple, and I think you all know it. The, the, the professional designation exam is what they call the final summative assessment. And it's the way that we at the EAB can determine whether you, as a non-principal estate agent in this case, can basically integrate the theoretical knowledge that you will have gained from the NQF4 with the practical on-the-job learning that you will have gained working as an estate agent. 
And there's nothing wrong with uh, answering the PDE by using your practical experience. You, you're not going to fail. If, if, if the question is design, I don't know, say a business plan, and, and in your job and in your daily life, you've designed business plans, you don't have to worry what the textbook says. Put in your successfully designed business plan. You won't go wrong. Uh, the, the, the fact, though, is that you do need to work at it and you do need to have a good grasp of these things. When, when people come and say, I know it all, it's a recipe for disaster. Because if you're, if you're a know-it-all, uh, you, you, you're not going to want to learn, you're not going to want to obtain advice, you're not going to listen, and you're going to land in trouble. Well, one, one of the things to know, and I do agree, is when it's necessary to obtain advice and information, do so. You, you have to understand the norms and values of a state agency. Uh, you've got to realize planned goals. Um, as I say, I believe that everybody here today is realizing their goals. But there's nothing like reassessing goals from time to time. Now, sometimes goals get old and they get stale and they're no longer valid. So occasionally, probably once a year, sit down, reassess where you are, where you want to be. Are you achieving your goals? If you're happy you're achieving your goals and you've done a reassessment, brilliant. If you feel that you need to make changes, make changes. But you need to reassess from time to time. Uh, and you have to plan to reassess where you're going. Um, you know, so a, a strategy might be brilliant under certain circumstances. And then there's a change in circumstances, and you need to slightly uh, uh, work on that strategy to make sure it fits the new circumstances. So the one thing is you need to go back from time to time. What they call it, the feedback loop. You need to see where you are, use the feedback loop, change where necessary, and make a success. CPD interventions. Um, I hope you, uh, you've, be, you've been at other CPD interventions that you've learned things from that things that you didn't know, things that are going to make your life better as an estate agent. The one thing I've actually said to our CPD presenters is if, if the estate agents attending CPD walk away with one or two new things that enable them to better their performance as estate agents, enable them to understand something that they didn't understand before, you've achieved your objective. You know, you're not going to learn everything. Uh, we're following the New Zealand model of CPD. You said we're following the New Zealand model. Are our qualifications um, acceptable to uh, New Zealand and Australia and the UK? Yes, there is, re there is reciprocity of the qualifications. Um, they are acceptable. We've had, a lot, we've had a lot of estate agents who've gone especially to the UK. Well, not, not so much the UK where they don't really have these qualifications. United States, New Zealand, Australia, Canada where we will get a letter from the regulator of the state that they're in, probably New South Wales or Western Australia, whatever the case may be, and we will, we, once we as the regulator in South Africa have confirmed the qualification, have given them a background, we actually refer them to the SA Qualifications Authority website, we give them the curriculum, and those qualifications are accepted. There are additional subjects that you have to do which are peculiar to the, the country you're in. Like, for example, in Australia, you might have to do a bit of their constitutional law. Uh, but generally, yes, there is reciprocity, and our qualifications are accepted. And that is thanks to the services CETA in large measure. Because the services CETA, as a quality assurer of these qualifications, ensures the reciprocity. They know, they all have a, a kind of services CETA. Uh, uh, environment in these countries and they're aware that there is quality assurance and these are not Mickey Mouse qualifications yeah, they are accepted okay career um, we've touched a bit on professionalization we're now going to touch very briefly on what a career is and um, why it's so vital for an estate agent to understand that no matter what it may appear to look like to outsiders Estate agency is a professional career. If you do not accept it as a professional career, you're not going to be successful. You have to know that you're entering into a career. It's a lifelong choice. Uh, it's a career of choice. You need to be happy with what you're doing. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not going into this in too much detail. The one thing I do want to say is that you need to cherish your career. You need to understand your career. And you need to know that it is your career that puts the bread on the table. So your career is all important. You're not in the state agency profession uh, simply uh, to waste your time. You are here to make a difference, to engage in a career, and to become a successful professional career person. 
So career is the word that we use uh, when we refer to what you do in your working life. And what we believe at EAB is that continuing education, CPD, plays a major role in advancing your career aspirations. Um, I'm not going to worry too much about that. I think we do deal with it later. Let's have a look at this little cartoon. Uh, here we have, a, we have a seller and, and an estate agent. And the seller says, we're asking for 3 million rand. But if it doesn't sell quickly, we're willing to settle for 40,000. Yeah, a bit of a difference. And, that, and that's what I said, you know, uh, when you find some situations, I, can I, I must be honest, I don't think there's one estate agent in the room here that would walk away from this transaction. There's a, there's a huge difference between 3 million and 40,000. But would you walk away from it? Would you, you would negotiate, you would discuss, you would tell them that maybe 3 million is out of the question point, and you'd, and you'd draw them, you'd bring the 3 million and the 40,000 closer, closer, and you might sometimes agree on a mandate for 1.2 million. You know, you, you, you would do something. You would not do but you would not walk away from this transaction. So, so what I'm trying to say is that the, the choice is yours to make. To be an estate agent, you do need skills, you do need competencies, you do need knowledge, and you do need to know how to negotiate. Um, we, I, I think it's very difficult to teach a soft skill like negotiation. You, you, you probably will only learn negotiation through experience. Once you've negotiated, you'll make a mess of a couple of them, and then you'll find your feet and you'll be a star. So you, 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 CPD, brilliant. Practical experience, better. Maintaining the career path. Um, what I, I'm just going to go through this very quickly. You know, they're, they're different. Uh, we've seen there are different ways of being an estate agent, and there are a whole number of different specializations in real estate. Uh, we've looked at it, there's commercial industrial, there's residential, there's auctioneering, there's business broking, there's agricultural sales. Um, there, there are a whole lot of different specializations in estate agency. And your career path means that you need to choose that specialization that you are happy in, that you are successful in, and that you make your career out of. But the fact that you've chosen, for example, commercial industrial, doesn't mean you're excluded from rentals. Or, or rental administration. If you decide, you know, commercial industrial is, is not looking so great and I'd like to go to rentals, go to rentals. Do whatever is necessary, but when you do go to rentals as a commercial industrial agent, understand what rentals involves, C acquaint yourself with what you need to know and become a rental agent. You can go up and down. You can become, you start off as an intern, become a non-principal estate agent and then a principal estate agent. Brilliant. You, you might find a non-principal estate agent says, you know what, I don't want to become a principal estate agent. I'm happy working as an estate agent. I'm doing what I love. I'm quite successful at what I'm doing. I don't need the hassle of all the administration. I don't need the hassle of running an estate agency firm. I'm happy to remain a non-principal, and that's perfect. You might find others who say, I would like to become a principal. I, I have entrepreneurial skills. I want to basically uh, be a principal and become a principal. And then you're going to find you've got principals of many years standing who don't want to leave the sector and we don't want you to leave the sector because the knowledge that you have is invaluable and we want you to impart that knowledge to newcomers. But you might decide, you know what, um, I'm not going to be a principal anymore. I'm going to downscale and become a non-principal. Great. The, 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 the choice is yours to make. You, you do what you want to do in estate agency and be happy in it. The one thing we don't want to see is square pegs in round holes because you're not going to be happy and your clients are not going to be happy and the EAB is not going to be happy. The only ones that are going to be happy are our disciplinary committees. So we don't want that. Horizontal movement, as I say, you can go up or down, not a big deal. Uh, as I say, you, you, need, you need to know what you want to do Acquaint yourself with what skills you need to do what you want to do and do it. Um, choosing a career, it's, it's in the packs that you've got, so I'm not going to belabor that. Uh, we'll go through some of those things. Uh, let's have a look at this. Uh, have a look at the, at the little cartoon. I'm just saying maybe we should look for another estate agent. Why? Why? Hey? Why? You, you be... Yeah, you people, you, you don't involve yourself in this kind of thing, according to some legal expert. You, you don't have to. Would you, would you use this estate agent again? <laughs> okay. You know, the, the fact is that what we're showing is you need marketing skills. 
I, I promise you, if I was the owner of the property and I came back and I saw this, I would boot that estate agent immediately. Because in my view, if the estate agent cannot put a for sale sign up properly, goodbye. I don't want to use that estate agent. It's just a sign of knowledge and professionalism. And uh, it, it, again, to revert to our poor, our poor legal boffin, um, I think he's completely wrong when he says that you, don't, that, you, that you don't worry about these kind of things. You do worry about these kind of things because they impact upon you directly. They impact upon your daily life and they impact upon what you do. So being a, a successful estate agent needs skills, it needs knowledge, and um, if you don't possess those skills and knowledge, and if you do put your for sale boards upside down, you're not going to last in the sector. Remember what I also said, referrals. No one is going to refer this estate agent to anybody. People versus task orientation, I'll go through that very quickly. Estate agents, generally, estate agents in the field are people, people, people. They are able to work with people, they're able to interact with people. They are marriage brokers, they're sociologists, they're psychiatrists, they're divorce lawyers, they're all these, they're all these things. They're able to take conflicting interests and bring them together. They're negotiators, they have a lot of skills. People, people work with people. But on the other hand, you get task-driven people. People who are rather sit in an office and work on spreadsheets. Sit in an office and do admin. Sit in an office and do, do anything but go out and interact with people. And that's great because we need people, people, and we need task people. You have to identify what you're best at. If you're a task person and you are trying to work with people, you're not going to be successful. Alternatively, if you're a people person and trying to do tasks, you're going to hate it. So you just have to understand where you fit in in the scheme of things and do, do whatever it is that makes you happy as an estate agent. Comparative, well, what, what I want to take you to is comparative evaluations. <clears throat> now, where this education is concerned, a lot of people think that the EAB sucked a syllabus out of the air and said, you know what, we're going to make life difficult for estate agents. Let's make it as hard as we can. Let's make it difficult. Let's make it impossible. But you know what, it, it's not like that at all. Um, the EAAB is a member of what we call the Association of Real Estate License Law Officials. It's an association that's centered in Chicago in the United States. And it represents, I think, it's about 120 real estate regulatory bodies in, like the EAAB throughout, throughout the world. And we interact with them, and we benchmark with them, and we understand what estate agents in all jurisdictions are doing, and we benchmark against what they're doing. So we, we have two benchmarks. We have the international benchmark, and we have the national benchmark. International is we look at what all estate agency jurisdictions are doing. The local national benchmark is we look to see what professional bodies are doing. Remember I said there are about 50 of them. So we also keep in touch with our fellow professional bodies to make sure that we're not going overboard and that we're doing something that will be acceptable. So um, what I'm going to take you through now is th this applies to the United States. I just want to show you what they're doing, and then at the end I'm going to ask you a question. So let's just see what they're doing for, for their education. They're doing, and I'm, going, I'm just going to give you the headings. You can read the, read the, the, the gist of what, what the headings are uh, when, when you have time. For their education, they look at principles of real estate. They look at the law of agency, law of contracts, prescribed contract forms, real estate finance. Real estate finance, to just digress for a minute, very, very important. We believe that real estate finance is something that we probably should be concentrating on more. We believe that estate agents who have a grasp of real estate finance will be better estate agents, will be more appreciated by sellers and buyers and whoever else they're dealing with. And I can almost guarantee that next year that we're going to have great presentations on real estate finance to assist, to assist everybody. Now, the, the people who remember the very old um, EAAB real estate course where we used financial calculators. The people who mastered it, and it's so easy, today you can just go onto Google and do it, but it still looks great. If you take out a financial calculator and you punch in a few numbers and you give them answers, they are so impressed. So you'll say, you're buying a property at 1 million rand, you're going to pay a 200,000 rand deposit, you're going to take a bond of 800,000 rand over 20 years at 11%, and we'll punch in a few figures, your, your monthly repayments are going to be 8,500 rand a month. 
But if you pay in an extra 500 rand a month, your monthly repayments will be 9,000. But over the 20 years, you're going to save yourself 348,563 rand. You know what a great impression that makes? They look at you as an expert, and you are, and they look at you as a knowledgeable person who can do calculations, and they can ask you any kind of question. What if I skip a month? What if I add a, add a year at the end? And you just punch in a few figures, and you give them the answer. What better way is there of selling yourself as an estate agent? And it's simple. You take a little financial calculator, and you look like the most knowledgeable financial person ever. And so we're going to go back to that. And uh, these days, as I say, you can do it on Google, but I still think for effect, have a financial calculator, it looks brilliant. Real estate brokerage, this is what they teach. Real estate appraisals, you do that every day of your lives, I, I should imagine. You have a look at a property, you do a comparative market analysis, you give a figure, and why it's so important, go back to what I said, they will believe you. A seller, if you look at a property and say, for this reason, that reason, and the other reason, this property is valued at 1.25 million, they will accept it. No one is going to query you. So we want to, we want to know that you are doing the proper thing when you give a real estate appraisal. So we're going to look at that as well. Real estate law, we deal with a lot. Okay, I'm just going to go back. Now, I'm going to go, there's a few other things that they deal with. But now I just want to ask you a question. You've seen what the overseas jurisdictions do for the education. Is there anything included in those things that we don't do? We do all of it. We do all of it. There's not one heading there uh, of, of, of real estate education that they do in the American jurisdictions that we're not involved in. Every single thing that they do overseas, we do, and that leads to the question of reciprocity, why there is reciprocity, because there's nothing that they do that we don't do. Let's have a look at this little uh, scenario. Uh, state agent is talking to potential buyers. Now, this is what the potential buyers are saying. If the seller is willing to replace the roof, add a deck, put in a fireplace and an indoor pool, extend the living room 15 meters, and move the whole place to the other side of town, then we're probably definitely interested, okay? <laughs> How many of you have found possible buyers who are like that? Yes, I love the place, but, 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 but. And are you gonna say, sorry, this is not for you? No ways, you're gonna try and say, Oh, I don't know what you're going to try and say, but you probably, if you're a good estate agent, you're going to conclude this deal, even under these circumstances. So you, so you are people who have knowledge, who have experience, who have expertise, and who have qualities that the ordinary homeowner does not have. And that leads me to a question. A lot of homeowners will phone the EAB. Do I have to use an estate agent? And the answer is no. If you're selling your own property, you're not selling it for on behalf of anyone else, you're selling your own property, go for it. You don't need an estate agent. Oh, because I'm not prepared to pay that commission. Fine. Don't use an estate agent. Sell it yourself. <coughs> Sell it yourself. And really, the reality is, I promise you, this is the truth. A week later, that person will phone back, can you give me the name of a reputable estate agent? It is not easy to, uh, if you are un unaware of the pitfalls, if you don't have the knowledge, if you don't have the skills to sell property. You have to be involved, you have to be experienced, and you have to have knowledge. And s m I, the, I would say not 99% of the time, 100% of the time, the would-be self-sellers will use an estate agent and be satisfied with the result. Look around in the neighborhood in which you live and see if you can find for sale signs by estate agents. See who are the most visible estate agents. Ask your family and friends. Compare uh, referrals. We, we will never ever say go to Joe Bloggs Estates because obviously we, we have an idea of what's happening but we don't really know. All, all, all we can say is if that estate agent holds a valid fidelity fund certificate, we accredit that person as a professional but we will, will not recommend anyone. So real estate marketing, uh, remember what the, what the law professor said? Don't have to worry about this, huh? Don't have to worry about this. Real estate marketing, can I ask you, would you survive without real estate marketing? Never. Really, and is real estate marketing easy? No. How do you learn real estate marketing? Through theory and through practical application and through experience. 
And with those three things, you become an expert real estate marketer. You are not going to be an expert real estate marketer if your prime objective, as per our legal boffin, is not to worry about these things. Find a buyer, find a seller, and you're home and dry. They do real estate mathematics, and this is something that, um, that we also uh, are very keen on introducing for estate agents by way of CPD. I don't think estate agents are fully aware of real estate mathematics, and it's a valuable, valuable tool, whether you, which, whichever sphere of estate agents, commercial industrial probably have a better knowledge of cash flows and things like that, but I believe that all estate agents will need real estate mathematics, and we're going to be introducing that next year. Property management, I think we do already. Real estate investments. Real estate investments is another thing that we're carefully looking at because we found that um, real, you know, you know what they say, they're not making any more real estate, but they are still making more people. So the result is that real estate is a great investment, especially if you look at today where, this, where the equities are plunging, where, where we worried about the Chinese uh, rate of growth. Um, what better can you do than real estate investment? So we, we want estate agents to basically span their career path and not just be real estate salesperson, but real estate investments, particularly in this area. You, got, you are going to find people in this uh, well, I think in the whole of South Africa, who are going to come in and ask you, what can I buy as a good investment? And the answer is property. And then show your knowledge, show your competencies by explaining why property is a good investment and what you can show them. Real estate investment is something we are going to concentrate on. Residential inspections. This is brilliant. A residential inspections is something that they do have in the United States particularly. What happens is when, when you... Uh, a potential purchaser and you're looking to buy a house, if you don't understand the dynamics of uh, property, you're going to ask somebody to come in, look at that property for you, give you a report. You probably pay five, six thousand rand, but it's money well spent. You'll get a report um, and they'll say um, the property is selling for one million, but we believe there's certain defects that are going to cost you 50,000 rand to repair. Therefore, don't pay more than 950,000. Now, why am I telling you this? Because it's a career enhancement opportunity because some of you all of you could become residential inspectors uh, provided there's no conflict between yourself and the persons involved um, if one of your colleagues is selling a property and the purchaser approaches you and you've got nothing to do with that sale there's nothing wrong with you going in and doing an inspection the the big problem is we're going to prescribe a course for real estate inspectors to ensure that you're professional that you understand and that you can do that but it's something that we want to create career advancement opportunities for estate agents. And this is a great, great opportunity for us. Now, do we meet these requirements? I've said yes. The future uh, of, of education for real estate profession, we've heard Pam about the service CETA. The current um, qualifications, NKF level four and five, fall away at the end of December 2019. So from 2020, we do have to have those new occupational qualifications. And as I said, don't fret. It's not going to apply to you. It's only new entrants. Uh, we've got this NQF Level 4 and NQF Level 5. We want to make, give advanced courses in property, It'll take you up to six, seven, eight, nine, to whatever you want to go. So we are looking at that. We're looking at various universities. Again, totally voluntary not going to be prescribed, not going to be compulsory, but we do want to create opportunities to advance education. What we found, and we're very chuffed about it, is that people who do the NQF Level 4 and NQF 5 sometimes get bitten by the study bug, and they decide, no, I've done the 4 and 5, I'd like to do the 6, and I'd like to do the 7, and at the moment there's no opportunity really, so we're going to create that opportunity. So that's something for the future, and, uh, but it's, it's very real at the moment, especially uh, where, where we're operating with Department of Human Settlements in creating an academy that will offer uh, additional courses. The, the last thing I want to do quickly before you can go uh, is just tell you uh, the question of how do you disclose your qualifications and designations. We're still seeing a lot of business cards and a lot of uh, letterheads, which will say Joe Bloggs uh, RPL. RPL simply stands for recognition of prior learning. It means nothing. Then they'll have Joe Bloggs NQF Level 4. NQF Level 4 means nothing. It just means that you did a qualification on the National Qualifications Framework Level 4. So uh, the, the way to do it is like this. 
Um, the, the first one, Joe Bloggs, FETC Real Estate PPRE. Joe Bloggs comes in as an intern and he does the NQF Level 4 Real Estate Qualification. That's the Further Education Training Certificate Real Estate. He will then write Joe Bloggs uh, FETC Real Estate. Once he's passed the professional designation exam, he can write PPRE. Similarly, uh, now remember, in academia, the higher qualification always supersedes the lower one. So if you've done the FETC real estate and you've done the National Certificate Real Estate, you only use National Certificate Real Estate. You're not going to say FETC real estate, National Certificate Real Estate. You use the higher qualification that supersedes the lower one and the same with the designation. So uh, blogs will come in, uh, he'll put National Certificate Real Estate, MPRE. Uh, if he's only got the PPRE, remember, to become a principal, uh, you've passed the, the National Certificate Real Estate, you then have two years to do the professional designation exam. So during those two years, he hasn't got the MPRE, he'll still put uh, PPRE. Uh, people come in, uh, there, there is what we call these equivalency exemptions. If you have certain relevant real estate qualifications, and they have to be relevant, they have to basically align with the curricula of the NKF real estate qualifications, you can get an equivalency exemption against those. Having, uh, we get a lot of BCOMs applying for exemption. Now, uh, the, the BCOM guy will say, uh, I've got an exemption from, from the NKF Level 4 and 5, can I use those designations? The answer is no. You will use your BCOM, and then you'll say your MPR, your PPRE, as the case may be. Once, once you've been to Kosimampuru, you'll take out the PPRE and the MPRE, because th those will be taken away from you. So it's just, just to understand, um, uh, th there's my email address if you need anything. Uh, now, the important address, ceo at eab.org.za. That goes directly to Brian Chaplog, our CEO. Um, what I would like you to uh, get through to him is anything that you believe will fill educational gaps that have not yet been filled and that you would like to hear uh, at CPD presentations. And I can assure you, the one thing about our CEO is he does listen to uh, emails that are received, he does take cognizance of them, and he will act on them. So if you believe there's anything particular that you would like to uh, have included in CPD presentations for next year, now's the time, because we are finalizing our CPD program at the moment. Um, and CPD, uh, if you have general queries about CPD, and I know what your queries are, my points haven't been allocated. Uh, the, the auditorium was full. Uh, Margie did something bad to me. Well, whatever the case may be, uh, you can send that to CPD at EAB. And with that, thank you very much for being here. It's been an interesting session. I've learned a lot. I hope you've learned something. And thanks for being here. <laughs>